architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. So, John, let's uh, begin by, uh, you have this uh, formidable reputation <laughs> in the city. Huh? Well, thank you. I, I think so, as, as a, uh, you know, conversation builder, as a person uh, very interested in um, building a uh, culture of public discourse of a certain different kind. Yes. Uh, there is public discourse, you know, of course, of protest on the street, there's public discourse in formal political arenas, but what you host through the famous uh, John Bolin conversations yeah. is, uh, is, is something that is unique. Uh, well, thank you. So, and, and you're, you're, I've been on one of, your, one of your conversations, I have some idea, but let's start by, you know, tell me briefly describe what are the kinds of conversations you try and hold and what are you trying to do with them? All right. I've been, I've been doing conversations since the 1990s yeah. and I moved away from the idea of a panel discussion to mm. a round table. Mm. And what I usually do is I bring in four guests, yeah. four, three, five, but mostly, most often four, yeah. from a variety of disciplines. Usually there's an artist somewhere in the group. Yeah. But I try to mix up people from art and science, or art and business, or yeah. or or uh, art and and his, uh, artists and historians, a variety right. of people to talk about a topic. Right. The topic may range from uh, from uh, uh, light and sound mm -hmm. to building 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 beautiful cities mm -hmm. to community organizing to uh, uh, politics to the nature of science. Right. So and the goals of these. I don't know what the goal of this is. It's just to get people talking and meeting each other, yeah. making, making new connections. For me, it's been kind of my ongoing graduate seminar for years and years and years mm -hmm. without a teacher. Without it's sort of perfect. Yeah, the um, your own university. Yeah, it's my own university, and I get to have this graduate education of postgraduate <laughs> or of, of just sort of people, <laughs> people with an amazing amount of expertise and passion. Yeah, coming in. The, the reason why the round table as opposed to the panel is it, it avoids the embarrassment of someone from the back standing up and saying something and identifying themselves. And you realize the person in the back has has more expertise and passion than, than anyone on the panel. Right. And, and oh, yeah, yeah. And, and you realize, oh, this, this person should be up front. Well, when you do a round table, it doesn't matter if someone's in the Everybody group. Everybody can participate. Everyone can participate. Yeah. So that's and, and they're usually quite small conversations. They're intimate groups. Um, it's not like there are 300 people sitting I mean, around. The group has generally ranged in size from as tiny as 15 to as large as 85. The 85 mm. is a little hard to manage, and it can often yeah, be yeah. unruly. And the subjects there have ranged from sculpture for some for various reasons. Right. To to a series I read called "What Do We Do Now After right. the Twenty After the Twenty Sixteen Election." Right. Um, but yeah, it's a manageable group, and right. that's and that and that's key. And and it seems to me you have some, uh, you know, a sort of a driving passion in all of this, is to connect uh, art and science, kind of the frontier of uh, digital thinking in the world. Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about that, you know, what is that about? Well, I've been, I mean, I've been passionate about technology and, 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 and interest in it, in it since childhood, uh, you know, as a science fiction geek, but I've also been involved in art, writing about art, uh, looking at art, working in, in worlds of art. I worked at Microsoft for 15 years, uh, -huh. uh, uh in web publishing. Mm -hmm. So I was surrounded by, by software. Yeah. Um. And so I've straddled both of those worlds, and it it has often occurred to me that that there that that nexus between art and science and art and technology can be a fertile ground for creativity and for really interesting explorations. Okay. Often it is not, uh -huh. but it can be. Yeah. So in twenty in basically in about twenty fourteen, it it occurred to me 
that uh, in about 18 months was going to be the half century anniversary uh, since an event that happened in New York called Nine Evenings Theater and Engineering, mm -hmm. in which the painter Robert Rauschenberg got yeah, together yeah. with an engineer from Bell Labs named Billy Kluver. Oh. Kluver had worked with Jasper Johns, Andy Warhol, Rauschenberg himself to, to provide effects and, and certain technologies for their art. Right. But these, these two men produced this event called Nine Evenings that right. was Nine evenings of performance art driven by the high technology of the time. Right, right. The high technology was infrared cameras and right. live on stage video projection right. and Doppler sonar. Right. Um, so it was it was crazy. Some of it messed up. Some of it didn't. Yeah. The public was since the work they had ten artists performers included Rauschenberg, John Cage, yeah. a number of the of the dancer choreographers from the Judson Church Dance Project. All '60s minimalism. Wow. Uh, a lot of the people who were uh, who were uh, who were in attendance couldn't quite figure out what was going on. Did they record all of this? Yes. Yeah. There is there is video out there. It's uh -huh. some of it's online. Okay. Um, anyway, it was it was it was sort of a pivotal moment, although only known historically by people who were interested in it. Mm -hmm. um, fast forward 50 years. 2016 was the half century. No, first, 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 before we do your sort of version of that, yeah. why, why, how, d tell us why it was pivotal for you. I mean, why do you think it uh, forfeit as a pivotal moment? What, what, what the value is in all of this? Yeah, yeah. No, that event. Well, that event was, I mean, that event was so, it was so, um, when you see the old video, you see these, these, uh, these performers and artists working in the same room with these engineers from Bell Lab. They right. had 30 engineers and technicians from Bell Lab, who basically, Bell Labs, who basically... Op, uh, and it's a very analog world, isn't it? it? A lot of it's analog. It's on the edge of digital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, uh, Bell Labs had invented the, the, the vacuum tube at the, be at the beginning of the 20th century, and, right. and, and in the middle pretty much invented the, the transistor. Right, right. So the transistor was invented, the, the, uh, the integrated circuit, a lot of work had been done, but yes, yeah. the switching systems were very much analog, and they were massive and complex. And there's Rauschenberg and John Cage in between, uh, yeah. they're like producing music and producing art. Producing art, pr producing performance. Um, the the Rauschenberg piece yeah. uh, starts out with with 40, 40 floodlights of the sort I mean of the sixties version of what you see in a tennis court at night mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all around this massive armory the the sixty ninth regiment armory in New York City where the armory show was held famous space okay. uh, in the middle is a tennis court right uh, that's that's been built onto the tennis court comes. Uh, the painter Frank Stella and his tennis coach. Right, right. He's in the white white flannel. She's in the little tennis dress. Right. All very sixties. She she does the whole measuring of the net to make sure it's the it's the proper height. Uh -huh. All of that, and then they begin to play. Uh -huh. What happens as they play is that each racket is is is. Uh, Outfitted with a vibration sensor mm -hmm. and a small FM transmitter I see. that transmits to to a, a retransmitter just next to the next to the uh, the court, yeah. which transmits up to a switchboard yeah. up in the up in the uh, above above the bleachers yeah. that then sends out a command to do two things. So every time you hit a ball, the vibration creates an effect, and the effect is a sound. It's not walk walk walk. Yeah. It's bong. Yeah. Bong, yeah. she's hearing bong, bong, <laughs> bong, <laughs> bong. And each time the ball hits the racket, a light goes out. Oh. 40 lights. So slowly the room descends in, into darkness. I see. And with the darkness, there's a huge cloth screen that's hanging above the audience's head. Uh -huh. And on this is projected um, the infrared image of. Of, I forget how many people. I think it was about eighty people. There may have been as many people in the in the on stage as there were on the yeah. audience, um, and each person. These people were were volunteers who'd been gathered, I think, in part from a school that that Rauschenberg had had given money to, yeah. um, and were given an instruction to make a motion. I see. So you have these people standing in the dark making these motions, yeah. not seeing anyone around them, yeah. and they are then um, captured in, in infrared and that is projected wow. on this huge screen. 
So, I mean, that's the kind of work that they that's did. That's the milieu. And I, what it reminds me of is people like uh, Edgar Varese. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. And the work that, do you know, he did with Le Cabousier at the Philips Pavilion uh, in trying. Brussels. What happened? Oh, it's just this pavilion kind of made in the shape of a... Hyper, uh, a stomach made in the shape of a hyperbolic paraboloid mm -hmm. and inside That's that right. Corbusier projected all these strange images as if it was some kind of a personal history mm -hmm. with kind of black light uh, things and moving colors and in between there's this Edgar Varese's music which goes like Tong! things like that yeah, I have a sense it, of that, that happening but don't know anything about it I'm talking about that milieu it's the sure. 50s and 60s sure. and they're yes. they are determined in a cross disciplinary way yes. to advance the frontier of artistic and scientific thinking in a single register yes and I think one of the interesting differences between then and now yeah. is that the engineers really they had to kind of come up to speed as, as somebody pointed out uh, the artist would ask them to be able to do something and the scientists would, or the engineers would say well you don't have to do it that way you can do it this way right. and this way would be a lot simpler but it would have no it, it, it would not have the artistic effect that the, yeah, art, yeah. That the artist was looking uh -huh. for uh -huh. And so those, those, those back and forths were very educational. Right. So what, what, what is your project? Now bring us to um, your 50 years on. Well, so 50 years on, there were, there were events that happened all over the world. There was one in London. There was a big, a big event that happened at, 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 uh, in London. There was, a small, there was a smaller video festival that happened in New York. Yeah. Uh, there was a showing in Turkey. Yeah. There was a small event in San Francisco, all to, all to commemorate the half century. Yeah, yeah. We went with the whole nine evenings concept. We had nine days and nights of, of installations and, and performances. I think the numbers are something like 14 performances, 15 installations. Uh -huh. Most of the performances were- Here in Seattle. Yeah, here yeah. in Seattle. Yeah. Um, in the attic of, the King, of King Street Station. I see. Which above. was a big raw space that's now being converted into the offices of the Office of Arts and Culture. Right, right, right. The city's, right, city's right. arts, arts yeah. office. Yeah. But, yeah, and so we were able to produce dance, uh, a dance performance that looked at surveillance. The Exarch from the university did a piece around, around neuroscience and and sound. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Duell, who, who is a, uh, an MD, a neuroscientist, and uh, uh, a composer, uh, worked on a project using a, a tool he calls the encephalograph. Which was, uh, which is a tool that allows people to make music with their with their brains by thinking. Mm -hmm. That was something that 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 was tried to do, in terms of, of the EEG when it was invented, mm -hmm. but until you could bring in really good software into the in, in, into play, it mm -hmm. was it was much more of a rough on off thing. Right, right. I'm thinking, I'm not thinking. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to actually being able to guide the qualitative nature of, of the sound. Right. Um, so with that tool, uh, the user is able to make the pitch go up and down huh. and, can, and can play music. I see. Those are the kinds of things we did. We had a- What was your favorite? What would oh. describe to me a successful evening from your perspective? Oh, I think, um, well, there was an amazing night when there was a, Coleman Pester is a young choreographer and he produced a dance uh, it was part of a series he's doing called Pylon, and this was about surveillance. So there was surveillance, live surveillance video, as well as computer animations happening on these screens mm -hmm. above the dancers. And the dancers were all dancing a piece about identity and surveillance and hiding. Right. Um, but then one of those dancers, David Rue, also danced with a, a project that had been produced by a, a, um, an artist here, Romson Bustillo. Okay. And... Um, Romson was working with a group of artists who were, who were brought together by Ellen Ziegler uh -huh. to look at, at artist reactions. First it was artist reactions to neuroscience, uh -huh. and then we were, when we were having trouble getting them some, some, some scientific input yeah. for a while, they also then branched into, into dark matter. So, uh -huh. so, the, so the, the group of, uh, of artists bifurcated. Some looked at dark matter, some lo looked at neuroscience. Um, Those are both like, you, you have me, like it's like, Dark matter and neuroscience, yeah, know, what an incredible I know, topics. I know, I know, I know, amazing <laughs> topics. Well, Romson did a piece of, of batik hangings uh -huh. 
that were uh, that had a lot of symbols and then some zeros and ones, and and then did this performance with David Rue, a dancer who was also in the other other dance piece, about uh, the differences in language, and and linguistic conventions and slang conventions between the Filipino. American community and the African American community, mm -hmm. and it was an amazing performance. And there were large groups of people from both communities, both as an audience and as participants in the piece. Now, how does this connect to neuroscience or dark matter? Well, again, the dark, the not not dark matter, but for neuroscience, he was looking at, and forgive me, I don't have to go back and actually yeah, yeah, no, actually no. read read the read the underpinnings, but yeah. the underpinnings was how we make language. Ah, I see. And and so it was looking at at differences between two communities and the ways they make language and the way yeah. they think with their language. Yeah. Um, so, so language is to know, right? I mean, really, you know, languages uh, uh, frame what we can and cannot know. Sure, sure. I mean, it is. It is. Uh, it's it's why. Uh, uh, early on, French was was a language of. Ex of discussing various things right. that that say German mm -hmm. was much better at at, at at explaining or discussing um, some concepts of science, philosophy, and and uh, right. and engineering. I mean Possibly. that kind of thing. Yeah, and then there are languages of architecture, and then there are languages of art, and then there are sure. languages of dance. Sure. And those two, you know frame our aesthetic worlds, our aesthetic universes in particular ways. Yes. Um, I've been looking at, as I told you the other day, I've been looking at this idea of, of how we get beyond the language that we're using now to describe this, this interplay, uh -huh. this interaction. Excuse me. We, um, we end up um, looking at the idea of art and science uh, and art and technology i mean art is the overarching term for everything for 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 creative endeavors from mm -hmm. visual art to music to dance to theater but when we look at art and science and art and technology it becomes really easy to reduce the, reduce that interaction uh, to a really simple uh, set of levels mm -hmm. um, and I've even, when, when I was communicating with a woman in New York and she used the term sci art, S-C-I hyphen A-R-T, mm -hmm. I realized that, oh, it, we might have already jumped the shark on this uh -huh. uh, because it's, it becomes categorized and it becomes simplified when it's actually a very shifting, complex set of interactions okay. that you can't describe simply uh -huh. like sci art. Oh, that's just sci art. Right, 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 um, right. So I was. So, so I, is that like an established category in contemporary art, like sci art? People doing sci art. Yes. And what do they normally kind of do? Do you have any idea? I mean, like. Well, to me, I think that what we're seeing a lot of in terms of art and science, mm -hmm. is uh, or art and technology, is I mean, neuroscience is very popular, uh, especially since we're moving into uh, into machine intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, and machine learning, right, um, and 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 big data, yeah. and all of those areas are very popular to look at from an artistic lens. Yeah, but to me, a lot of what happens when people look at art and science or art and technology is they play with a certain set of tools, and those tools may make their art stronger, but it doesn't necessarily do what I think needs to happen. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, they'll just be playing with a certain software and that will help them produce certain kind of let's say parametric forms and then they call it art because it's done via their sort of certain aesthetic right. viewpoint. Right. Or they may be working with 8K video as opposed to 4K video. Right. The, the right. 8K video gives them so much more resolution, so much more right. ability to create images. Right. Uh, which is fascinating and, sure. and, and useful. Yeah. But to me there's there's a there's a goal. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And the goal is that art and science and art and technology need to inform each other. But what happens is that, that by working together, the artists inform the way scientists and technologists 
scientists and engineers ask questions and pursue those questions. Right. Similarly, by working with the artists, the yeah. scientists and the engineers right. affect the way the artist asks questions and mm -hmm. pursues those questions. Yeah, yeah. Which, like a real uh, dialogue. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And those dialogues don't happen enough. What happens in a lot of cases where um, an artist may come into a, to a, to, to a corporation to be an artist in residence, mm -hmm. um, or you set up a project where there's an art science uh, uh, interplay, is that nobody has time to actually go into it. I mean, the, the scientist who's working on the project is also working on, on um, his or her uh, uh, research and so it, it... It's also skepticism, isn't there, for some reason? There, uh, there can be. Yeah. But I think that nowadays we are seeing... I mean, when you, when you take a look at software, mm -hmm. if, you, if you hung out with a group of, of, of coders, mm -hmm. uh, a large number of them are, fr are frustrated musicians. And some of, them really? are, are some of them are actually really good musicians. Yes, they want to play in a rock and roll band. It's really an interesting thing. Um, I found it, I mean, it's, there's no scientific research on it, but, and I think it's possibly because of, a, of a, the, uh, the similarity of language, of figuring out using these, uh, these discrete pieces of data, whether it's a note or, a, um, or, or an object in code. Um, to, and this put, is your guesswork. It's guesswork. But I, I know so many people, yeah. and you realize, oh, it can't just be the people I know. Yeah. Um, I, think it, I think they do tend to lend... Did, did you think that writing code in some way is like writing music? I don't think it's like writing music, but I think it appeals to similar impulses in people. Mm. Um, and not even writing music, because a lot of the people who are, who are coders are not writing music. Mm. They're playing music. And... There's a there's a there's a rigor in writing code, right? And there's a rigor in playing music. I see. Yes, I can see that. So um, it's, they both appeal to a certain kind of uh, personality. I think so. Um, <coughs> and uh, most of the people who are, uh, I think, most of the people who are, are coders slash musicians mm. are n never become superstars. Mm -hmm. They're just people who like to play. Um, so be don't become superstar coders or don't become superstar musicians? Superstar musicians. Uh -huh. But they um, can be superstar coders. Yes, I think they can. And occasionally they can be superstar musicians. Mm -hmm. I know of one, of one um, person from the software world who's an exquisitely good guitarist. Mm -hmm. And he's content to play backup. Um, Do you know any exquisitely good musicians who are also coders? Um, I'm sure... Yes, I do. Mm. Um, but what is happening now, which didn't happen 50 years ago, right. is that we're seeing a lot of people who are what I'm calling hybrids. Yeah. People who have an art degree uh -huh. and an engineering degree. Really? Yes. Again, I don't know about the demographics. I don't know if you could see that. It's all anecdotal. But you're seeing it more and more. People who come out of, the, especially come out of, out of software, and some out of what software? Just come out of the software world. Yeah, yeah. Who also have an art background. Really? <laughs> yes. And realized, oh damn. Here I, in Seattle. Yeah, here in Seattle. I know, I know many people. People who work in Microsoft. People who work in Amazon. Large, but they are, but they are coders. They're not doing, you know, interface design for Microsoft. They might that. be doing interface design. They might be doing. They might be program managers. But they are. But they're operating in a tech world. They know tech. Mm -hmm. And they're also musicians or painters. Mm -hmm. um, or even even within the family, the painter whose 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 wife works works in software, mm. um, or, or so on. There there are more and more overlaps than there used to be, mm -hmm. and I think that's a very good thing. So, do you think the sort of digital creativity, digital coding world, thinks of themselves as, in their own way, as creative artists? But that's been a question I've had from, from people. This who, is your project, isn't it? Yeah, in a way, yes. Uh, I, mean, I mean, do scientists feel the same way? Yeah, uh, do they? That's uh, a good question. I don't know. 
Um, I think they may, I think they may harbor the idea that, yes, what I'm doing is creative. And often it is, or it can be. Um, There is a certain creativity that, um, that comes with this, with, 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 with all these endeavors. It takes me to what I'm looking at in terms of language. I was talking before about, about, about shifting language and yes. shifting away from art and science and art and technology, mm-hmm. uh, keeping, the, keeping the broad term art, but rather than art and science, going toward the idea of art and rigorous inquiry. Yeah, 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 okay. Yes, art and rigorous inquiry. And so... Um, what do you mean by that? Well, most of what we do in the world if we do it well, mm-hmm. requires some kind of rigorous inquiry. Correct. And by rigorous inquiry, there are many different types. I mean, science is 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 focused on the scientific method, um, a, a specific model of 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 moving forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, art can be any number of uh, of investigations, but the key there is that there is an investigation. There has to be an investigation. Right. There has to be a look. There has to be uh, a uh, uh, a way of of um, examining the world in a really clear, thoughtful way that's very careful. Even though an artistic product may seem like it's wild and crazy, mm-hmm. or even a, a piece of a piece of software may seem that it that it just came together. Mm-hmm. There were so many steps of just looking and carefully examining things. Sure. And how do you play with that? How do you play with those examinations? How do you bring those examinations uh, into uh, into focus? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's part of what I'm looking at. Right. I mean, in, in a sense, what I'm hearing you say is that this idea of rigorous inquiry could function as a... Uh, not a translator, but a sort of a via media to effect a two-way dialogue between a coding scientific discursive universe and an aesthetic, visu- uh, aesthetic productive uh, discursive universe. Yes, that's, that's a lot of what I'm thinking about. Right. And then the other piece of language that I've been looking at is art and industry. Mm-hmm. Rather than art and technology, okay. Because What's the difference for you? Well, technology is a term uh, that has been used to suggest digital technology. Right. That's it's a it's 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 code for digital technology. Mm-hmm. Um, Shorthand for digital. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We no longer mean it. Well, Boeing. We have Boeing. So. But but even even putting two sticks together and rubbing them to create fire is right. a certain kind of technology. Okay. So I mean, there's a reductionism there. Yeah, yeah. But but um, it's true. I mean, why are why is digital technology differ different from from um, from creating an eye beam mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or 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 creating plaster or um, or any kind of a, any kind of the analog communication technologies. Um, the idea of industry just came to me because I was looking for something again outside of that idea of technology because it's too it's too the term is 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 weighted and mm-hmm. and it loaded with with meanings yeah 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 um, and there's this sort of an, uh, anti technology yeah, yeah. I love technology right. but what does it all mean right right. Uh, the idea of industry came to me because industry has two roots, and no one's quite sure which one is the is is the most important. Yeah. One root is diligence. It's mm-hmm. a, there's a there's an early word for diligence mm-hmm. in industry, and the other one is building. Okay. And you can see it in the way he is. He's very industrious. Right. 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 He, he uh, or he or she works um, with diligence. Right. Um, the same way with industry, captains of industry, they build things. Right, right. Well, that is a, uh, a sh- that both of those terms could be a shorthand for how we create the, uh, the built universe. Right, right, um, right. 
how we actually fabricate everything we make, whether it's clothing, yeah. whether it's whether it's buildings, yeah. whether it's it's iPhones. Yes, yes, yes. It's all about building. It's all about 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 putting pieces together. If I if I'm if I'm intuiting what you are saying with this is, it enables us possibly also to not get caught in this uh, uh, digital versus real divide. Right. Exactly. One can see of all the entire digital industry as a made thing. Right. Right. It's just manufacturing of right. a certain kind. Sure. In fact, indeed, to a certain extent, it's just traditional manufacturing. You have to make that iPhone. Yes. Uh, and so it has a very tangible architecture and materiality, and, and, and as does everything. One can think of it all as kind of very tangibly. Yes, it can. And I think that when artists work with, with, those, with, with that tangible, that tangibility, mm -hmm. um, in some ways they think they're working with, with the product, with the, with the magic, mm -hmm. but they have to learn to work with the tools, the, the, uh, the, the actual manufactured ma uh, materials, manufactured goods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but it also gives us a way of saying that art can interact with a variety of, of modes mm -hmm. of, of making. Right, right. Um, so, uh, and they can cross each other. Right. Um, I know you're you're fascinated by Alexander McQueen and yeah. and, and fashion and yeah. fashion and architecture. Yeah. It's very similar in a lot of ways. When we talk about wearables, we're talking about about embedding digital technology into clothing fairly right. often. Sensors. Right. Yeah. Um, and making uh, making the clothes do something. Mm -hmm. There are lots of people who are working in chemistry to actually make the clothes do do things themselves without any any digital technology. I see. Um, whether, I mean, uh, you, you look at, at the technology that is produced a lot of the clothes we wear, mm -hmm. um, uh, especially the, uh, the synthetics that mm -hmm. came up after World War II, mm -hmm. amazing technologies. And how those factor into art is an interesting angle. Um, Tyvek, for example, became a popular medium for, for painting. Right, uh, right. Um, and what is it? what is useful about it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can't say because I'm not a painter, right. but there are things that give it a, a value that canvas doesn't have. I see, yes, yes. So that's an interplay between art and a very rarefied um, material uh, manufacture. Right, right, right. I like that, I like that. So you are putting sort of two things on the table. One is the idea of rethinking industry, and the other idea, other is the idea of... Uh, thinking about this notion of rigorous inquiry as a, a via media to think about various disciplines. That would be a good time for us to take a break. Sure. We're in a conversation with John Bolin, and we are talking about uh, the intersection of art and science. We'll be right back. Hello, everyone. Thanks for listening to Architecture Talk. This is a self-supported podcast based on an initial grant from the GAHTC. For more information about GHTC, please visit GAHTC.org. We release a new conversation every other Wednesday. So, if you are enjoying this conversation, please do be sure to visit our website and to check out some of the earlier conversations. From the website, you can also subscribe to this podcast and you can listen to the other episodes. You can also simply directly subscribe to us via Spotify or via the podcast app on your iPhone. And of course, we are available to be heard via any of the other podcasting apps that are available on the internet, such as Stitcher, Overcast, etc. We would also love to hear from you if you have any questions or just some comments, or even have a suggestion for a future episode. You can reach us via the contacts page on architecturetalk.org. Thank you for listening again. We're in the middle of a conversation with John Bolin on the on his conversations and the whole intersection of art and science uh, and advancing that as a frontier. So, so before we continue, John, tell, me, tell us a little bit about uh, how did you grow up that you got in, in, involved in this sort of diverse areas of thinking in this such a creative way? Where did you tell, give us a little bit of a biography mm -hmm. that connects into this? 
I grew up in Pennsylvania. Okay. And uh, and partly in New York All right. City. Mm-hmm. My father was a um, he had been a steel worker yeah. and an actor. Uh-huh. And uh, so I suppose there uh, there's there, that. There is a little bit yeah. of that right there. Yeah, and my mother had been a, a career girl in New York. She she didn't marry until she was thirty seven years old, which uh-huh. in those days was very rare. She had mm-hmm. me when she was thirty nine. Um, um, but um, yeah, my father had been a um, he worked his way up in in, in steel and. In, uh, when he retired, he was production manager of a of a Bucci, a steel mill about the same size as the new core mill, mill okay. uh, in Seattle, uh-huh. um, making rebar. But um, and then he came out here, retired out here, and uh, from Pennsylvania, and and created a whole new acting career. Um, he's actually, I can I can readily ask people, have you seen Sleepless in Seattle? Yeah. And and the question is that my father was the um, uh, the elevator operator who takes Meg Ryan up the Empire State. Oh Park. yes, yes, yes! Of course, yeah. that's an incredible scene. Yeah. Everybody yeah. knows yeah. that. Yeah, scene. yeah, I, I know, I know, I know. And he gives her, he says a few a few, a few supportive words to her. Yeah. Um, and the other, his other major. I mean, that was a tiny role, but it was, but it's been seen all over the world. Oh sure. And, and other, it's an iconic moment in the I, film. I so. know it is. It is. Um, and his other major claim to fame. I mean, he acted here. In, so, so, so you belong to a part of Seattle uh, cliche. I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, he was also the mayor of Twin Peaks. Oh, okay. <laughs> now that's serious, Seattle. Yeah, I know, history. I know, I know. It was amazing. So, so there's all that. But I, um, I never, um, I never had enough patience with mathematics. Hmm. To become a good engineer or a good scientist, right? Um, so I've always dabbled and been interested in the topic. Uh-huh. Um, written a little bit about it. I loved. I uh, I did a lot of writing about soft technology when it was happening, and especially in the in the seventies with the the advent of, of of new solar design and that kind of thing. I see. Seventies and eighties. Soft technology. Yeah, soft technology was the term that was used at the time. Uh, appropriate technology, alternative technology, technology okay. with it. Why was, is it called soft technology? It would have low impact. Ah, uh, what's the hard edge? For example, um, low head hydro um, uh, electrical generation right. would have very minimal uh, ecological. Uh, effect, right, right, but would right. still supply power. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, windmills now. Wind generators are massive, and they have, they yeah. do have, 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 fa- have fairly uh, major possible uh, uh, effects in terms of, say, birds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, they're not like a nuclear power plant. No, no, uh, no. So anyway, uh, I've always had this interest, yeah. and uh, uh, my education was in. Uh, English literature and, and world history. I got. I got world history. That's yeah, my yeah, topic. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I I got two I got two bachelor's degrees. Uh-huh. I created the second degree just by taking a lot of extra courses when I was in college. Okay. Um, oh, oh, I have enough en- enough courses to do two two full degrees. So that's okay. what I did. Excellent. And I made a point. Um, this there weren't all that many interdisciplinary uh, programs then, but I was able to make one myself by yeah. by choosing courses. I would choose a course that would that would complement another course. So I would choose, uh, I'd be studying uh, Asian literature and translation at the same time as studying a course about, say, uh, the British in China. Uh-huh, uh, uh-huh. And, and be able to get a, or, or Japan, uh, the rise of the, uh, the Meiji Restoration, right. that kind of thing. Right, so, um, so, so really you're a global thinker, both a global in the sense of global history, yeah. But also global in the sense of cross disciplinary. Yeah, I try. Yeah. My my master's was at the U, and it was uh, a communications master's. I'm not sure why I took it because yeah. uh, the program then was was very heavily into effects research, yeah. uh, uh, numbers crunching, and I took those courses. But it wasn't what I was really interested in. Uh-huh. I was trying to do a critical theory degree, and it I was able to put it together. But my my what my, did critical theory mean to you then? Uh, well, I mean, it was the heyday. It was the it was the nineties, so there yeah. was uh, everybody was looking at Derrida. And, Derrida, yeah, Lacan, yeah, Foucault, yeah, sure. Deleuze. Yeah, and <laughs> I'm I was I was a lightweight in those areas, okay. but in the end, my 
my thesis was looking at how the New York Times contextualized Tiananmen Square for an American audience. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What kind of language did it use for this cross-cultural communication? Right. Especially since Tiananmen was loaded with so many reference points, right. both to, to, to China and to the West. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, you, you had students singing the Internationale, yeah. but... Or were they? It's hard to know because unless one speaks Chinese, which I don't. Right. Um, but the uh, but the, it, those those weeks when the students were in Tiananmen was a reference to any number of events in the twentieth century, like a sit down strike, like mm-hmm. a hunger strike. Mm-hmm. All those things were happening. Mm. So they were this. It was almost like this. Uh, this end of century review yeah. of twentieth century politics around the world, right? Nonviolence, yeah, yeah. Um, and how do you capture that? Yeah, especially uh, so. Those were the kinds of things. Were I, you here during the uh, WTO protests? Yes, yeah. Did yeah. you participate in? What's so, your memory of those? Oh, um, I mean, I was living. I was actually living at a residential hotel, and the, a lot of the people in the hotel were people from out of town. So mm-hmm. I, I hung out with them. But I also I was working temp. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't. I, 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 okay. So I couldn't take off too much time. Right. I, right. I, I worked the first day, took a bus out to work, took a bus back. The bus would actually have to reroute because it couldn't go through town. And then I and then I would I would I would do the nighttime demonstrations. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But had many great stories. I mean, it was it was fascinating. Okay. It was weird to watch because you could see what it was already selling the seeds of its own destruction in a way. Uh-huh. Um, in that. Radical street actions tend to finally fizzle uh-huh, uh-huh, um, uh-huh. Um, in ways that... Uh, because why? Because when you try to rally hundreds of thousands of people yeah. who don't know each other, who've never been trained around a certain discipline, right. it all goes, it all goes, goes crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just reading about, um, about the, Spartac- the Spartacists, the mm-hmm. Spartacus League, Yeah. In, in in Berlin yeah. uh, right after 1918-1919 okay and and how that all fell apart okay um, and it's it's really hard to do it's really hard to affect change through street action okay. you can do some things but sooner or later the powers that be are able to pull back pull everything back sure sure um, so how did then from from this background how did you become a Radical conversational <laughs> conversationalist. Um, the conversations were kind of accidental. I was I was editing an art magazine here called Reflex uh-huh. that ran from eighty six to ninety six, uh-huh. and it um, I was the the manager for one year and then the editor for the last two years, and um, we closed up shop in ninety six for reasons I won't go into. Mm-hmm. But one of the side elements of that project. Was that we there was a, there was an art panel discussion mm-hmm. that was a, a corollary to the magazine, mm-hmm. and it was run by a number of people. Mm-hmm. I I took it over in those last couple of years and ran it, mm-hmm. and there was usually artists talking about art, but I got kind of tired of of uh, I've I've never liked the panel framework. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it's too it has too many problems. Right. Um, and the idea of artists talking about art. It's interesting, but I but I wanted to mix it up. So, when Reflex ended, I kept it going for for a while, killed it, and then we we resurrected it as a project through the Seattle Art Museum. About a year later, pulled it away from the museum, and I morphed it then into a, a way of having a roundtable and taking a look at how you might bring bring a conversation of, uh, about physics mm-hmm, mm-hmm. into art. Like we had a conversation about gravity, a conversation about about life. A conversation about gravity. You have a scientist talking about gravity, but you also have a dancer talking about gravity. That's amazing. Um, and so, how do the two of them interrelate, and how do those two treatments interrelate? Yes. So those are the kinds of things we've I've been doing for almost twenty years, pretty much twenty years. Yes, that sounds like such a great idea because gravity I can immediately see. How the scientist and the dancer have to deal with, and I think we might have, I, we might have had an architect in this in the same yeah, room. Definitely, the architects have to deal with gravity. There's the no time. question about yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but now you are having conversations where 
you know, you have us all talking about dark matter and uh, yeah. Yeah. and more sort of uh, difficult, uh, but still very real uh, uh, things in the world. Well, they come and go. I mean, in terms of difficulty, but yeah, I mean, I'm trying to trying to keep them complex, and producing them is exhausting because it's like herding cats. You have to try to bring four people into the same room at the same time. And do it and do it a month in advance or a couple of weeks in yeah. advance. You can get it. So it's and I'm up. I've been doing it without any funding. Yes. How do you do it? You just you just make a lot. You just send out a lot of emails to people. Right. Um, and I have a huge number of people I know. Mm. And it's really funny how sometimes uh, I may not I may not have a conversation in the works two weeks out, and then, and then someone says, "Why don't we do this?" And I say, "Oh yeah, you." You could be part of that, and she could be part of that, and then the conversation happens. Right. There have been times when I when when nothing nothing came up. So I've done I've done conversations where I just said we're going to talk about uh, we're going to take stock of the world, mm -hmm. and those are usually smaller, maybe twenty people. Mm -hmm. But again, the conversation, I think the sweet spot is about thirty to forty people in the room. So is this can can we describe this as a kind of another kind of a alternate radical public agency i mean it's kind of called to arms to people but in a very different diffused slow burn mind transforming way versus something that happens on the street well it is i think one thing i'm i'm pleased with is the amount of connections i've made between people mm. over the years yes for sure uh, somebody who is uh in this discipline, meet someone in that discipline, and they become friends, collaborators. Yeah. I've had that happen a number of times. Right, 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 and right. Yeah. I mean, I have had had um, a variety of people yeah. uh, through through the conversations. Uh, several mayoral candidates, either before or after they were, ma I mean, years before or years after they were, they were um, in the mayoral position. Right. Have come through. Okay. Um, a number of well-known scientists. A number of 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 uh, successful artists, so it's uh, and um, so, I love it when when two say social organizers meet and they're coming from two from two completely different directions, right? But they find commonality and then they become friends. So in a sense, you know, you're building this community uh, around Seattle, but in a sense, isn't 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 it also true? And I think we uh, weren't we talking about this uh, earlier that uh, Seattle is making you, Seattle is making the conversations. This is a, a community in a sense that, uh, do you think this is a community that is uh, somewhat subliminally partial to such kind of intersecting conversations? <laughs> That's a good question. I have a friend who thinks that Seattle is a government experiment. <laughs> Um, to produce these kind of docile liberal people. Who yeah, are, yeah, I uh, can see that. <laughs> uh, who, are, who are just happy to do all the, all the things that they do, and they're, yeah. and they're sort of, and uh, uh, I mean, she has, has real questions about Seattle. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm seeing a lot of, of commentary on Facebook about how Seattle's lost. There's the one, the city we thought we had is we don't have any more. Well, it's changing. There's no question about it that. It is changing, but I heard comments like that 20 years ago as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I can imagine um, what it must have been like to live through other changes in the city. Right. Um, we are living in a moment when we have an incredibly vital uh, uh, cultural scene happening here. Massive numbers of, thing, of, of performances. Right. And some of it's high quality, some of it's not. I don't think we have a level of excitement that we should in a city of this size and money and intellectual heft. Yes, um, you mean you know we don't have the kind of cultural and aesthetic excitement yes. that we should have for a city with the kind of digital and economic firepower we have. Yes, it's yeah. true. And why is that? Why is that? <laughs> I don't Tell know. me. Um, I don't know. Part of it is that we're so physically isolated. 
Yeah. And the isolation works works in in some ways for for developing products because you're just here developing the products. I mean, isolation didn't stop my Amazon from becoming a global superpower. Right, but but the but but the thing that happens when you live in a capital, when you live in a um, in a center, is that people are always coming through. There are there are waves of 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 influence, and. Seattle has influences, but it doesn't have waves of influence the way you would have in a city where there are, where there's other vital cities 50 miles away uh, or 100 No, I miles. understand. I understand all that, John. But nevertheless, I'm interested in what does make this city tick and why is it that we have, you know, in, in, in a sort of Twin Peak land do we have Amazon and... Uh, <laughs> And uh, Microsoft and Boeing and and these sort of uh, this should be a you know small town in the backwaters of somewhere. Yeah. It is funny how that uh, uh, all of those all those companies decided to locate here partly for resources. I mean, uh, uh, I would assume Gates came back because he grew up here. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah, but, but still. But Bezos came here because Gates had been here, and there were so was there were so many software developers. Uh, I think. I mean, that's been that's been been um, one of the stories. Mm. It sort of has 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 uh, 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 efforts have piggybacked on other efforts. Sure, um, sure. But I think that Seattle was a working class city for decades, a city of, of the first, first and one of two major general strikes in the United States. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was a labor hotbed for a long time. Sure. And there, I think, were concerted efforts in the city to turn it into a much more of a white collar city. And I believe that that, 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 that happened through a number of different uh, Different effects or different different actions that weren't necessarily concerted. Some of them were. Some of them came on from on high in terms of people with money, uh-huh. but some of them were accidental. But what it has produced is a city with uh, a major inf- a major intellectual inf- infrastructure and resource infrastructure that is uh, conducive. To creating new products, I guess I'd say that somehow of a variety of sort. Uh, but so we see the new sort of digital and uh, aeronautical products. Uh, are you beginning to see any signs of new? Because uh, one of the advantages of not being part of the usual East Coast, MoMA, New York uh, network is. You know, you don't get sucked into the usual discourses about what art is and isn't, right? Uh, well, isn't there an opportunity for us over here to... Uh, wouldn't you think that there would be some uh, an aesthetic, artistic milieu tapping into the science and the technology, uh, science and the industry that is around here? I would like to see more of that. The thing that's well, two things. One is the lack of the lack of discourse is interesting. I know people who've gone away to cities, especially in Europe, where artists, poets, writers, musicians can't stop talking yeah. about 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 uh, about theory, yeah. about what art is. Yes, and there may be a problem with that, but it does tend to have an effect of of challenging yeah. the way people think. Yeah. And without that discourse in Seattle, we uh, don't have it at all. We, we have your conversation. We have it to an extent, but yeah. not the way you would find in a in a, in in a lot of other cities across the world. Mm. Um, and so, it allows. Are we against critical theory and critical thinking and intellectual discourse in this? City? I no, not against it. I just don't think it has it has has uh, come into. Uh, Come into play in terms of the way the way we make culture here, and maybe that's perhaps, good. Perhaps that's what is exactly what is changing now. It could be. I it, mean, finally, I think Seattle's, you know, uh, a, you know, opening into a milieu and economic and cultural condition where all these conversations can start flourishing. 
I think they can. I mean, obviously, people are 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 afraid because uh, of the income inequality and yes. the cost of living. Of course. Uh, and something has to happen. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people. Uh, and yet, I know so many people who work in the arts, who are married to somebody with a good job. That's right. And so it becomes this strange form of patronage, 21st century patronage, um, your husband or your wife, effectively. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And that, that is, a, whether it's viable, I don't know, but it's, it's actually fairly common in this town. Um, don't you think your conversation about art and rigorous inquiry could become a Seattle thing? Oh, I think so. I'd love to see that happen. I'd love to see the, uh, us looking at conversations and and investigations and projects where the goal is rigorous inquiry the goal is um, using our digital industries and the sort of people who have the smarts over there uh, I mean uh, this kind of alliance that you are imagining between aesthetic production rigorous thinking as in science connected through industry is a thing uh, that is a project that still remains undone. The problem, the problem, of course, is money. There's no shortage of money in this town. Yes, but it, but it goes a certain way. And industry is designed to survive and grow and make money. That's what its goal is. It makes products in order to make money. Right. And so anything that appears to distract from that mission becomes superfluous. I mean, that's I'm speaking I'm speaking in, in, in real, uh, really absolute terms. But I think that there is a truth there. No, but you were earlier describing the uh, recharacterizing the nerd you know, whom we think of as a dullard who only knows how to code, as a musician, as a closet musician or a real musician. You and see if a lot we, of that. Yeah, you see a lot of that. And if we go with that thesis and we give to the digital nerds or their milieu or their desires this uh, creativity, uh, is it not possible to think of uh, these new 21st century industries as potential openings to a different kind of understanding of what productivity is. Sure. I think it could happen. It could be revolutionary. Um, and we could do it here because we are such a strange site of production. I mean, yes, we, we are strange. And that's uh, what is unique about us. Go on, sorry. Yeah, I mean, just, just uh, as I've... I've I've looked at elsewhere. We have a diversity of production mm -hmm. that you don't see anywhere. Well, what um, do you mean? Well, again, um, most cities are known for one or two things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Houston is known for oil and gas mm -hmm. and medical research. Right, right. There may be other things. Of course, it has universities, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, or uh, Hartford, Connecticut is known for, uh, I believe, insurance. Insurance, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and so on. Uh, Seattle is known for a lot of things. Um, we have this world of technology, but the world of technology is splitting off. Mm. It used to be just about software that drove desktop computers. Right. Um, but then it became software in the cloud. Mm. I mean, Amazon is the, the key business in terms of cloud computing. In the cloud and AI, yeah. yeah. And, many. and then, see, Microsoft is second. Yes, yes, yes. So and that's changed very quickly. Yes. So between a, so between the two of them, they pretty much have a lock on a large portion of that kind of computing. Mm. And um, again, uh, a lot of companies here are moving into AI, are moving into uh, uh, virtual reality. There's there's lots of virtual and augmented reality companies and projects happening here. Yes. Um, the uh, between Amazon and Microsoft, we also have large research outfits from both Google and Facebook happening here, right? As well as as, uh, but then on the other hand, we have Boeing, even right. though even though the uh, 
very traditional manufacturing in one sense, although yeah. it's very yeah. high tech now. Yeah. I mean, the company itself fled fled to Chicago, but but we still have this massive presence here. Right, right, right. Um, of aviation, but then we also have cutting edge aviation in terms of uh, uh, Elon Musk setting up uh, uh, a, a a facility in Redmond to look at space satellites. Really, uh, he's he's doing that. Yes, it's well, oh, it's SpaceX. Oh. In Redmond. Oh. And yeah. um, and what is what is um, what is Jeff Bezos Blue Horizon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got he's got his facility in Kent. Right, right. But then you also have uh, where the th- where by any reckoning the third largest port on the west coast, the Seattle mm-hmm. Tacoma Pair. Sure. And, and then we have Nordstrom's, yeah. we have Starbucks, yeah. we have yeah. Uh, yeah. retail in that sense. But we also have a have a massive amount of medical research and medical, ne- biomedical, yes, yeah. neuroscience especially and cancer. Um, yeah. Plus. Fred um, Hodge, yes. And then we are a major oceanographic center. I mean, right. Um, yes. So, um, and then we also have traditional industry. As I said, we have a steel mill right in the middle of the city that yeah. people don't even realize exists. Right, right, um, right. And then those, when you drive up and down the Duwamish, those massive cement and, and, and concrete facilities. Um, again, most cities have them, but they, they do provide a sense of diversity in the city. Um, and you're so right about that. I mean, it's a fantastic diversity of industries. Yeah, it is. It's and, rare. and we have somehow managed to maintain those, along with I think pretty, pretty distinct, uh, you know, craft traditions of various kinds. Right. Sure. Uh, so what do you do with all that? I mean, it it all of them hum along according to themselves, just as as we as we move toward toward the end of the world or whatever is going to happen in the next century. <laughs> right. But I mean, humming humming merrily along, yeah. but. Um, is there a way to build on some of those interconnections and the, and that diversity, and all of those uh, all those ideas mm-hmm. that are just uh, so much? Uh, we have we have structural engineers here. We have a we have a um, we have we have large architecture firms. We Massive, have yeah. the city is just overwhelmed with this brain power. Yeah. You could say, I mean, Boston has something similar just by the nature of having so many universities sure. and so many spin-off companies. But even still... No, but there's no Boeing over there. Yeah, there's no Boeing. And then uh, nothing like Amazon or Microsoft at that scale. Right. I mean, even Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley for, for, for pretty much one focus. Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. Yeah, they're one focus. I mean, I'm sure there's diversity there. But I'm very intrigued by this idea that that there is all this uh, brain power, but it's multi multi disciplinary brain power floating around in the city. This yeah. is not just Amazonville. Yeah, and indeed, uh, that is the, exactly the diversity, which is a valuable just in and of itself as diversity, but it's also the start point for thinking about how all this knits together. Right, right. Not to homogenize, but what are the possibilities, given that this is the 21st century and it isn't about specializations, what are the possibilities of kind of, you know, like neurons in the brain to affect uh, uh, electrical impulses across smart people in various uh, strong disciplines? Yeah. I think that sometimes the companies are trying to do those things for better or for worse with, with say, artist residencies or art programs in the companies. Mm-hmm. I think that sometimes they're successful, sometimes they're not. Right. But can we do something larger? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, can we try to knit together this this sense of, of, of ideas? Yeah. And with the goal of figuring out how the art how the interactions between artists, scientists, technologists can can bring us new ways of looking, new ways of thinking that can address the problems we face in the world. Um, I remember... Um, or a new way of being in the world. Right, a new way of being in the world. I mean, this is a big question nowadays yeah. with all the AI and all that. Like, wh- what does it mean to be in the world given f- Facebook, AI, and, sure. and the new things? 
One of my favorite design writers was Victor Papanak. Okay. Do you know his work? I do not. He was, I think, George Washington University in St. Louis. He was, he was a world traveler because he'd worked with UNESCO and various organizations. He wrote, his most famous books were nomadic furniture. Uh-huh. Uh, they were these big uh, books that looked at how you could build furniture that you could either move or take apart or throw away. Okay. But he also wrote a book that, that came out in two editions called Design for the Real World. Mm-hmm. And one of his, I, I mean, his whole basic thesis was, why are we designing radios to be to look like footballs? Uh-huh, uh-huh. I mean, product design yeah. that was that was merely designed to sell more product, as opposed to make better products. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, a lot of his uh, his design workshops were how you design objects that make sense to people. Mm-hmm. And uh, his ideas, I mean, a lot of the stuff talking about how you would, how you would create a, uh, how you could make, make a, something like a plastic out of grass, mm-hmm. out of, out of press, press fiber mm-hmm. that you could use for appliances, say to house a television set or something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. So, you, so if you didn't have petrochemicals, you'd be able to create a, a plast, uh, an industry that would, that would make something like a plastic that would be useful that way. Mm-hmm. Those are the kinds of questions he was constantly looking at. Okay. Um, and uh, I got on this because it's that sense of designing for actually making the world better. Right, right, right. right. And, and all the TV commercials from, from major corporations, they always claim they're making the world better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe. And occasionally they do. Sometimes they do. Yeah. But the structure itself, the system itself, is not getting better. I mean, you take a look at... Uh, I'm amazed. One of the most astounding things that happened with, with, the, with the interplay between cell phones and Facebook is the amount of video that shows up showing how much injustice there is. Right, right, right. Um, uh, everyday casual injustice, often directed toward, bl- toward, toward black people, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but everywhere, it's ubiquitous. Hardly a day goes by without some cringeworthy thing happening that right. shows up on the web. And that is a product of these technologies. That sort of stuff was invisible, except to the people that that it happened to, for dec- decades, centuries, uh, and now it's sort of just common. Um, it's common news. Right. Uh, what we do with it is another question, but at the very least, that that technological shift is astounding for mm-hmm. its for its power. That crazy event in Philly. Right. Um, With Starbucks, yes. And no, that's that, that's all. No, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, one of my sort of, uh, I was having this conversation with uh, Aphrodite. And, uh, you know, one can say we have a vision of what's a better world and then what can we do to get there. But the other way is to say, how do we change the world how do we change how things are done in the world? Mm-hmm. Right. Which is not necessarily a blueprint of a better society, right. but which hopefully then in that process will gestate into something different, which we don't know today, but which will really, which will we believe will be better. And we'll probably have a more, more organic root and effect right, than, right. than how do we make a better world. I mean, we still have to look, look in terms of solving problems. Sure, sure. But that takes us back to both art and science and right. technology, always about solving problems. No, but if we, if, we, if we sort of do your vision and really have art with rigorous inquiry and rigorous inquiry as an art project, then one is operating, you know, working with a different operating system, to use a right. current metaphor, uh, and then you get a different world. It, you do. It may, I mean, the, the tendency, the danger is, is to rely on techno fixes. Oh, we can no, fix no, all I this know, with, I know. with technology. But, but that's, not what, that's not necessarily what we're talking about. Right. Um, I mean, it could be, for example, that uh, I, I was in the Arboretum the other day, and there is a preschool that takes place in the Arboretum. 
Mm -hmm. It's actually run by, I believe it's run by the University of Washington. Okay. And it's an outdoor preschool. Mm -hmm. These little five-year-olds spend their days, like four hours a day, outside. Fantastic. Year-round, in the rain. Mm -hmm. They may repair to the to one of the greenhouses in the heavy rain. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, but they, um, the ability to do that requires uh, a leap of imagination. Mm -hmm. But it also requires a certain amount of waterproofing. Right, right, um, right. And it's a, it's it's not necessarily I'm going to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to look at how we do things differently. Right. Um, because in some ways it's a lot like there are people who 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 talk about about de schooling and 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 home study. Mm. There are kind of real out there people who talk about unschooling where you don't go to school at all mm -hmm. where kids don't go to school at all. But this is an interesting mix where you have kids going to a school framework, but they're doing it almost like somewhat controlled wild children. They're out there um, looking at little bugs and right. figuring out what those bugs are and collecting those bugs. And that's their, that's their day. Yeah, um, collecting bugs. Um, <laughs> I wish I had grown up like that and I, I'd got credit for collecting bugs. I know, I know. In, I know, in India, know. we grew up collecting a lot of bugs. I know. But we didn't get any credit. I know, I know. <laughs> And you also probably didn't learn all that much from yes, it. Yes, yes, yes. If you're just collecting bugs, you're not learning that But in much. this case, it's sort of, well, well, why is that bug the way it is? Right. Look at that bug. Why does it have those kinds of wings? Let's take a look at those wings and see what they do. Um, and those, that whole, that whole, again, we're back to serious, we're back to rigorous inquiry. Right. And uh, you're right. I think that we have the, we have the potential to make those interactions uh, in Seattle happen at a really interesting level. I like that uh, we are going to substitute critical thinking by rigorous inquiry. It's been a pleasure having you on Architecture Talk, John. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vikram. It has been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is Vikram Prakash, your host. And our producer is the one and only Sammy Prouty, a graduate student of architecture here at the University of Washington in Seattle. I hope you all enjoyed our conversation. And if you did, please do take a moment to subscribe and to rate us on iTunes. See you next time. Take care. Goodbye.